New York ain't New York anymore. How I miss those old pals of mine. Theodore Roosevelt's life is the stuff of myths and legends. It was a persona he carefully cultivated during his lifetime and one that people close to him protected after he passed away a century ago. But what did those who shared TR's private moments think of the Rough Rider? We'll get freshly uncovered insights from those who knew him best and hear forgotten voices like this guy. His name was William Savakul. He was chairman of the New Hampshire Theodore Roosevelt Centennial Commission, and he weighed in on what he thought of Theodore Roosevelt's decision to bolt the Republican Party in 1912 and run as an independent third party candidate. Give a listen. Mr. Savakul, could you tell me what your feelings are in retrospect about the Bull Moose campaign? I think the Bull Moose campaign, morally and legally, was justified. Because I'm convinced that Theodore Roosevelt had the delegates to nominate him in the Republican convention previously. Therefore, I think in that respect, the Bull Moose campaign was good. Right, well, covers that, isn't it? Hello, history lovers, and welcome. I'm your host, Dean Carianis, and this is the History Author Show on iHeartRadio. And a special tip of the hat to everybody watching today's time travel adventure via our YouTube and Rumble channels. You can find me at historyauthor.com, across social media platforms, or you can read my columns in the Washington Times to get my analysis of current events where I try to apply some of the things I've learned from historical figures like Theodore Roosevelt. In this episode, our time machine travels back to meet the 26th president through the eyes of friends, family, and confidants. This comes from 14 oral histories that were lost since the 1950s. This is an amazing find, and the man we have to thank for it, you'll hear from in just a minute. His name is Michael Patrick Cullinane, and he brings us these never before heard interviews in Remembering Theodore Roosevelt, Reminiscences of His Contemporaries. I previously shared Michael with you when we discussed his book, Theodore Roosevelt's Ghost, The History and Memory of an American Icon. If you recall, that's when we compared our busts, our TR busts, that is. He earned his because it came with a TR book prize. I had to go out and buy mine like a sucker or have it given to me as a gift. That's what you get when you're a really good historian. People start giving you busts of fun historical figures that you admire. You can listen to that interview in our archives or you can watch it on our Rumble and YouTube channels. Some of these clips that I showed today and showed then just like Michael Patrick Cullinane's book, are things even TR scholars have never enjoyed before. Michael Patrick Cullinane is a professor of US history in London at the University of Roehampton, and he's host of the Gilded Age and Progressive Era podcast. You can find him at michaelpatrickcullinane.com or on Twitter and LinkedIn. I link to all those, by the way, on the episode page for this show. The guy really knows history and he brings it alive. He's just so engaging and down to earth. But then again, all us Jersey guys are like that, right? <laughs> okay, now that we've arrived back in the days when a bull moose stalked the halls of power, let's join Michael Patrick Cullinane and meet the people who spent their later years remembering Theodore Roosevelt. And here we are with Michael Patrick Cullinane. He's joining us from across the Atlantic Ocean. We are unified by our real fascination and love of Theodore Roosevelt. His book is Remembering Theodore Roosevelt, Reminiscences of His Contemporaries. Welcome back to the show, Mike. Great to be back, Dean. Thanks again for having me. Well, you know me, I love to talk about our mutual friend here. He feels like a friend. And then when you get to hear from people who really were his friends, people that worked with him and knew him, family members, what a treasure. You lived every historian's dream. Who doesn't dream of going into those dusty archives and finding a crate full of tapes 
that have important historical interviews on them and you find hours of them about one of the most dynamic, somebody who still compels us today, figures in American history. How did you do this? How did you find them? How is it possible that these treasures sat gathering dust for seven decades? Yeah, I mean, the simple answer is just luck, really. I mean, uh, this is a room with a giant safe in it. This is the Theodore Roosevelt birthplace in Manhattan, a place where numerous biographers would have visited. Great biographers, Edmund Morris, Stacey Cordery, Kathleen Dalton, uh, the best and the brightest. And, um, and what happened was, is these magnetic reels were stashed away and the archivists at the National Park Service weren't entirely sure what was on them. But I suppose more uh, in terms of just how they could access them, the National Park Service didn't have a reel-to-reel -reel player in the birthplace for a number of years. I mean, they had basically switched over to cassette tapes by the 1970s. Of course, by the 1990s, it's all CD players. And, and we don't even talk in those terms anymore. It's all digital now. So uh, I stumbled on them basically by chance. Um, the, the archivist didn't know what was there and they didn't have the means to access it. And in 2018, I contacted them to find out how we could digitize them. And uh, thanks to Danny Prebut, who's there now, he's the, the, uh, one of the archivists at the Manhattan sites. Uh, he brought it down to a digital restoration company just a couple blocks from the birthplace. And now we have digital copies of TR's Friends. And it took a lot of work to get there, too. I mean, these are really old and a lot of digital wizardry had to be done. Stuff that, you know, I, you and I couldn't do even with uh, our sort of competencies in, in, in recording and, and stuff. It, it required a special touch. Amazing to think there it is in the middle of everything, the heart of it all in Manhattan down there you know, near the Flatiron building and also that his birthplace is a recreation. We discussed this when we discussed Theodore Roosevelt's ghost that he didn't want it preserved and they did it in spite of him and that is a, another great book to really get to know a historical figure and even if you're just into history it's a great template for reminding us that people aren't always remembered the way they wanted, and they certainly aren't always remembered accurately, and it, it's not always out of malice. Sometimes we do it because we really admire and like them. So here, when we talk about remembering Theodore Roosevelt in this book, you're hearing from people who really knew him and hearing new things. That, just to say it, I, I sound like I must be, must be lying or exaggerating, but that's exactly what it is. And you find these in that basement it would have been so easy to throw them away. It was not easy even to play them, to pop them in there. If you don't find them, I, I shudder to think it could have been another 70 years. And by then, this could all be lost. You say something about audio recording that jumped out at me here from remembering Theodore Roosevelt. And it's that, quote, the reminiscences had everything that written correspondence could not emotions, insecurities, adrenaline, pride, and misgivings. Now, when you say that, I realize in the next breath while I'm, I'm reading you writing this. So how did you go about preserving all of those elements, all of the emotion, so that people would feel this person was not just talking to an interviewer, but this person that we're reading what they're saying is speaking to us. How did you go about preserving that so it would carry over as much as possible to the written word? Yeah, that's a great question. And you're right, there's a paradox there because it is a book, right? Um, I've tried to preserve the dialogue as best as possible. So we see in, in the sections, uh, the, the questions that are being asked of the interviewees and then the responses as well. So that's part of it is establishing almost a sort of dialogue between the, the people that are speaking. But I suppose you can't really get to the, the voice. You can't get to those intonations or the emphasis that, that the speakers would have. And that's so essential. I mean, it would be great, like even like this, the body language that we share on video is a step even beyond the audio. So I, I think that that's critical. And, and for me, I wanted people to go and listen to these recordings as well. So anytime anyone says, well, what did Alice Roosevelt sound like? Or, you know, what did, what did political friends have to say about 1912? I say, go to the recordings. They're digitized now. You can contact the National Park Service and listen to them yourself. This book is really only your gateway. This is for the people that aren't going to strip mine, you know, the, the recordings that just want to get a taste of things. But if you really want to know what an old school New York accent a la the Roosevelt sounded like, you can now go and listen to family members and friends with that same accent. 
And I think that's great because a lot of the recordings we have of TR are so old and have degraded so much that he sounds just like very a na nasally character. Uh, and you'll see uh, Alice Roosevelt, for example, she has a very high pitched accent as well, but it's, it's, it's a little bit cleaner. You can hear it from the 1950s rather than say the, the 1910s. So the bottom line is, is I really want people to be able to listen to these things themselves. I put a couple of clips onto YouTube so they could do that. But if you really want to delve deep and hear what these people sound like, go to the archives and talk to the National Park Service. You managed to let Alice muscle her way in here because I was going to put Alice off, but she's like her father. They said, right, he wanted to be the, the bride at every wedding, the corpse at every funeral. He wanted to be the center of attention. And this comes up in Alice's life when she gets married. And of course, who does everyone want to hang out with? But TR, right? And, and same thing with her cousin, right? Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt. And so she's his first child. She lives this long life. They call her the other Washington Monument. She's worthy of many books herself. One is right here over my shoulder called Princess Alice. And that's a recent book. We're not talking 100 years ago. She's this fixture there in the nation's capital for almost a century of her life. She dies at 96 in 1981. So think of how long she lives and how long she's active. She's active until she's a very old woman in the social scene there and has great quips and things. But again, another paradox is she didn't like to be recorded. She wouldn't give speeches. There's a time they invite her to speak and it's a it's a reasonable forum, but it's not like it's the Republican National Convention or anything huge. And she goes up there and gets stage fright and apologizes and leaves when they wanted to write a column because Eleanor is writing a column and their rivals from when they're little girls as cousins that live near each other by that birthplace. She has to write a column, too, but she can't do it. She's too it doesn't think that way. They have a woman sit behind a curtain and try to transcribe it. Maybe what she's saying that doesn't work. So to me, this was fascinating to get her to open up. And because you were talking about what she sounds like, let's roll a clip of Alice that you've selected here for us. Something that's not in the book, which is great. It's something you won't be able to hear elsewhere or hear just by picking up Remembering Theodore Roosevelt. So set this up for us and then let's play it and we can comment on it for listeners. Well, the reason why this clip is so interesting, I think, is because, you know, th these recordings were done in the 1950s and Alice's are done in 1954 and 1955. And what is the most pressing issue for Americans at that time? It's communism, right? Whether you're talking about foreign policy or whether you're talking about domestic fears and McCarthyism, there's a red scare that is still, you know, it's petering out by that time, but it is still kind of the, the number one issue. And she's a political animal. She is, you know, meet, she's met up with Joe McCartney, uh, McCarthy. She's, um, she's gone out to dinner with uh, Richard Nixon, who she admires very much. And she is very deeply anti-communist. And what she talks about in this clip is where uh, communist infiltrators might hang out. The most well-known technique is a doctor or a dentist, nothing is more useful than that for the communists. That's very as, true. As a drop, they come with their information, they leave it there, the next patient comes and takes it. It's a perfect, the perfect uh, post office for them, because it drops. Also, a, do a doctor can do an awful lot of indoctrination. And of course, they can do some talking too, that, that. but it's more important just as a, um, a medium for communication. Oh. I mean, we, we sit there in the office and someone so comes in, there's two, two, two communes and they need a paper and that paper is given to the patient who the other thousand. Oh, yeah. Another patient comes in, has his teeth key and takes the paper away. Get the information from the, from the, from the uh, man who's in the position to give the information. Oh, and uh, nobody's around to see it happen? Well, there's nothing, no, because the Paris, uh, if it's done with Paris, Paris is a communist. Yeah. Only in Paris, so one of one of the courier comes, leaves the thing there, the other one comes, takes the work. Well, couldn't that be done by any, any two, uh, any two, three well, people? It, that, 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 there's no particular, uh, um, they could be found out. Yeah. I mean, you, you could meet the person with the corner, but then you're followed by the FBI. Oh, yeah. But if you're followed by the FBI and you go into the dentist, and <laughs> the dentist is a communist. Yeah. Uh, is, is he's not going to come and sit outside and you leave your thing with our fellow communists, the dentist, who gives it 
passes it on to a person who comes for it. Oh, yeah. So you've never been seeing contacting the person. Oh, yeah. Oh, that is a... Oh, oh I never thought of that. It's a perfect girl. Oh, yeah. So this is Alice being compelling. This is her really opening up and talking about something that doesn't make it into the book, but it's just such a, a human moment and a slice of life. So go ahead. Ed. What do you hear when you hear that? Take us back to when you first hear that, where she's talking about doctors and dentists and the risk of them being infiltrated by communists. Well, to put it in the wider context, she's talking about uh, McCarthy, uh, Joseph McCarthy and, uh, and, and Richard Nixon and the, the, the communist witch hunt. And, and she's, She's realized by the, the second interview that she does with Mary Hagedorn in 1955 that it's run its course. And uh, she's, she's somewhat disappointed about that because she still believes that uh, communists are infiltrating American government and it's a real issue for her. But all of this was wrapped up in a wider testimony that she was giving about, given about um, the politics of her time. And she starts off in the 1920s, really when the League of Nations is being promoted in the Senate by Woodrow Wilson. And she talks about how she led the Battalion of Death. And she said, you know, she got the nickname the Colonel of the Battalion of Death because she single-handedly, you know, corralled senators in her salon in D.C. to put a stop to the, uh, the, the, the Treaty of Versailles in America, at least anyway, and effectively ended American mem membership in the League of Nations. So that's where it begins. It ends later on with her talking about communism. But I mean, there's a lot of years in between where she worked with leading senators, Congress people, and, uh, and, and often thinking about her father's legacy in later years. And you can see why also something we may forget when we use the terms that we use in history, we think of the innocent people and we think of, we call it a scare, right? We call it paranoia. And that, that all comes so much later. It's easy to forget that there's a real risk. And she has seen the communist revolution. She, I'm sure, knew some of those people. She was called a princess herself. So when you hear the czar's children have all been gunned down, those princesses and, and the prince in Russia by communists, you're going to be afraid yourself because, hey, you live a pretty nice life there in Oyster Bay or in DuPont Circle in Washington, D.C. So you have legitimate fears of communism. And by the 50s, you see that that's become communists under every bed. It's gone from being legitimate policy fear that she had in her life to being that. And you can hear it there in her voice a little bit where she still is very collected, very, very direct. She she could have spoken politically had she chosen to or had she not had that fear. But you hear it right there in her voice. And it's not like, as you brought up, the TR audio we have where he sounds very high and reedy, which he did sound, but the equipment. Think about what you sound like if you were young, if you're over 50 and you recorded yourself on that cassette player or even older, if you ever heard yourself on a phonograph, you don't sound like you. It, it loses so much of the intonations. And let me just say one quick thing before I let you respond. Why don't we play a clip of Theodore Roosevelt here so people get an idea of what we're talking about, about the quality of the recording and how he sounds. The great fundamental issue now before our people can be stated briefly. It is... Are the American people fit to govern themselves, to rule themselves, to control themselves? I believe they are. My opponents do not. I believe in the right of the people to rule. I believe that the majority of the plain people of the United States will, day in and day out, make fewer mistakes in governing themselves than any smaller class or body of men, no matter what their training, will make in trying to govern them. Okay, so you know what TR sounds like from these recordings. So go ahead and, and you give me your opinion because I've, I've talked a little too much there about Alice. She did it to me again. I, I, it's, it's hard to get away from her. And she's one of the, the richest personalities on these recordings. You know, they, they all talk about how they're going to be heard and how people are going to think about their accounts of the past. I think one of the really interesting conversations is among TR's uh, nieces and nephews. There's three of them that are speaking in a group conversation, and all of them are very critical of uh, Franklin Roosevelt and Eleanor Roosevelt. They're all very warm and devoted to Franklin and Eleanor, but they have, they have criticisms about them from childhood, criticisms of them as politicians, um, criticisms of them, uh, you know, when, when FDR was, um, was when the Wilson administration. And all of this boils down to they were uncomfortable with sharing family secrets. 
So they're all very devoted to one another. And in many ways, what you get from these testimonies is that the Roosevelts are as much a network as they are a family. And you don't really want to mess with that network because it brings with it a lot of benefits. I mean, being part of the Roosevelt family is a, is a connection that is an important one to a lot of different political, business, and social uh, networks. So they are devoted to one another and they are reluctant to talk out of turn or out of school, I guess, about each other. Now they do to a certain extent, but you can tell, and Alice actually says this in her testimony, that her and her nephew would really like to do a tell-all piece uh, about the family. Uh, and she says to Mary Hagedorn, who's one of the interviewers, that, uh, that she's gonna do that. She's gonna come back and tell everything, but of course she never does. She just lets it hang there. And uh, Mary Hagedorn is so tempted and you know just wants to pull more of this out of her but Alice only gives up so much. And, and so does the rest of the family and the friends are very much the same as well. They're guarded about Roosevelt's legacy in the, in the wider Roosevelt family as well. Which brings me to the question of how we managed to get them to open up. And this man, Herman Hagedorn, who sets out to do this is fascinating in his own right, but you have people who guarded TR's legacy so closely and in an era where everybody writes a tell all book about their neighbors and loves to post secrets and never mind if you're a president or a former president in his case, but his widow absolutely Edith <laughs> tightly jealously protects his legacy. So Hagedorn isn't going to just give up. He decides he's going to go to the outer edges of Theodore Roosevelt's circle, people who knew him in the Badlands, maybe when he was a soldier in Cuba with the Rough Riders, and he's going to leverage that to get the family to open up. How does he go about that just as an interviewer? Because that's a great journalist skill that he shows there. Hey, you don't want to talk to me. I'll go interview some other people and I'll show you my work. You'll see I'm not doing a hatchet job. I just want to hear what you have to say. Yeah, that's what I find so fascinating about Hagedorn in this moment is that he realizes that oral history is essential to telling TR's story. And whether that's his journalistic impulse, as you say, he was a journalist for a while and he's a literary, he's a, he's a wonderful writer, but his impulse was to collect testimony from people. And when he went to Long Island to do that, he originally wanted to do a video of Sagamore Hill where Theodore Roosevelt lived and, uh, and, at, uh, Edith shut that down and, and she basically got a lot of the friends in the neighborhood to not engage with Hagedorn. Remember, Hagedorn really didn't know TR that well at, at, at that stage. He had only been around since about the 19, 1915, 1916. He wasn't a longtime friend. And it wasn't until the 1950s, basically, when he's interviewing the likes of Alice for this oral history project, that he had all the credibility uh, that we now associate with him. But in, the, in those early years, in 1919, he wanted to do a video and collect oral histories in Long Island, and it shut down. So he goes out to North Dakota to collect testimony from the, the people in the Badlands, the people that are in Medora, where TR ranched. And, and some of these people are rough riders and, and close friends, and they are very willing to tell their stories uh, about TR. And as a result, North Dakota has this really great artifact. They've got a film that Hagedorn made of Medora 100 years ago. I mean, you can see North Dakota as it was 100 years ago, thanks to Hagedorn. The film is incredible. And I just think what a loss for Long Island. We could have seen what Sagamore Hill and that estate was like 100 years ago. It would have been so different and such a, a treasure. But, uh, but, you know, at least we have something from Hagedorn. Yeah, you mentioned Sagamore Hill and what it looks like and what a, it's still such a beautiful house. It's a great place to visit. And to me, when you go there, I was fortunate enough to be able to go behind the velvet ropes. And I'll put some pictures up for people that are watching on YouTube and Rumble. You, you know they would have been pouring over those films and looking at it and trying to bring it to life. But here you have a way to make that house back into a home because people can pick up remembering Theodore Roosevelt and get an idea of what it was like to live and work with him beyond just, okay, this is where he had his breakfast. This is where he passed away. What do you hope that this book does where people walk in there and they say, oh, this is, I can hear the conversations that they would have been having at the time. I mean, to be honest, the book only scratches the surface of that Sagamore Hill life, but the recordings, man, do they go into some depth. I mean, you could hear about what the Roosevelts ate for dinner. I mean, to the nth degree, Alice talks about that. So does all of the, uh, so do all of the kids. Ethel Roosevelt talks about it. Uh, the, the nieces and nephews talk about what they ate, what dinner was like, and TR sometimes performing operettas 
you know, at the dinner table. I mean, it's a real personal portrait of family life. And I think one of the things that the book gets us a little bit closer to is that human character that this historic person was. I mean, he was a father, a husband, and, and a friend. And, and that really comes out in these stories, his hospitality, his warmth. I mean, there's uh, many people that talk about how he would always, you know, go out of his way to uh, be hospitable to any guest coming into the house. And, uh, and also very much what the life for staff in the house were like, you know, so what did cleaners and nurses and, uh, and cooks do for the Roosevelt's and also some scandals, you know, uh, there was a, a coachman, I think that uh, stole some jewelry and, and what happened to that person. I mean, so it's a very intimate portrait of the, the daily life of the Roosevelt's that you might get a flavor in, in some of the books, including Hagedorn's book about Sagamore Hill. But this is a very personal account. And if you get a chance to listen to the audio, you'll get a real flavor, pardon the pun, for what dinner and dining and those sort of hospitality experiences were like. You hear from some of those family members, and that's the thing that made me ask that question, because those were the guests. These people were guests there. This was his summer White House where people would come, and especially for him because he was there for years when he was in between running and people wanted him to run in, in those wilderness years. He was still really sought out and he was such great copy. Those reporters walking from that train station in Oyster Bay all the way to Sagamore Hill. That's chapter six. That's in your book, Remembering Theodore Roosevelt. It's called The Scions of Sagamore Hill. That's Edith Roosevelt Derby, his daughter and her cousin, Eleanor Butler Roosevelt. So I, I like that idea. I like that you can go there, find out what they have for dinner. That's that's where we hear everything, right? That's why the phrase kitchen table issues is always so so used, I would say overused in politics, is that's where we're gonna hear the real thing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I couldn't agree more with you. And I think that chapter on uh, Eleanor Butler Roosevelt, of course, there's too many uh, Eleanors and overlapping names, but this is <laughs> yeah. not the first lady, this is uh, Ted. Uh, uh, Ted Roosevelt, uh, the, the namesake of Theodore Roosevelt, uh, uh, it's his wife. She lives on the property for years to come, and Ethel lives just nearby until the 1970s when she passes away. But if you went to Sagamore Hill after it opened as a national park site in the late 1940s and early 1950s, you would have seen Eleanor Butler Roosevelt just down the road. There's another house there, if anyone visits, called the Old Orchard. And that's where she lived up until her death. So it was still a living, breathing place where the scions of Sagamore Hill still lived. And they had a real input on how you experienced the place. Um, so eventually the house now is a museum for a lot of the artifacts that were once stored at Sagamore Hill. But it also has that imprint of the children and their partners who lived on the site for many years as well. And of course, that's a great legacy, I think, of the house is that it's not just the story of TR, but the story of his kids, which also leave such a, a meaningful legacy for the United States. And, and so to have their story told there is a, a great addition. You talk in Remembering Theodore Roosevelt about the man we've mentioned here a couple of times that has this idea about the oral history, Herman Hagedorn. He won't give up. He recognizes how valuable these are going to be as historical artifacts. Then he enlists his daughter, Mary, who we heard asking that question in the clip I played in my introduction. How would life be without him? Let's talk about him if we suck him out of, out of the equation. He never does these recordings. How do you think our picture of Theodore Roosevelt would be different today if Hagedorn wasn't so dogged, if he didn't work so hard to preserve the real TR legacy even in the face of the family objecting and saying silence is the best policy. Well, I think we probably wouldn't have a portrait of TR like we do today. I mean, I think he would still be a compelling figure, but I can tell you that no one worked harder on the sites of memory that we have today. So those are places like the birthplace that we've mentioned, but also Theodore Roosevelt Island in Washington, DC, Mount Rushmore even. I mean, he was a, a driving force for all the memorials that are there. But also he was a driving force for collecting all of the images, videos, ephemera, like postcards. I mean, the, the Theodore Roosevelt Association under Hagedorn created a library that was so vast that it required, in its very first year, a, a full-time librarian and eventually numerous archivists. It, it, would, it would get transferred to Harvard in years to come, but it, it was a vast archive. I mean, so much so that things like these magnetic tapes got lost there. So... I think we wouldn't have 
the historical record without Hagedorn. I also think that we wouldn't have the, the sort of uh, academic record of, we wouldn't have the biographies that we have. And not just because Hagedorn supported biographers, certainly the ones in the 1920s and, and, and 1950s he supported thoroughly, but also he left a legacy as well. I mean, there's a great photo in the birthplace of Herman Hagedorn meeting John Gable. Both of them were long serving directors of the uh, Theodore Roosevelt Association. Gable took over from Hagedorn not long after he died, about a decade or so after he died. But there's a photo in the archives of Gable, 13 year old Gable meeting Hagedorn. So Hagedorn didn't just set the wheel in motion. He set a legacy for successive generations to utilize resources, to promote the legacy of TR and to understand that to understand TR in a historical perspective so that he would never lose uh, his relevance as a character. And I think that's that's so essential for, for all the work that I've done on TR. Uh, the, the groundwork was laid by Herman Hagedorn. So many things that both of them do to draw these stories out. It is not as simple as just putting out a tape recorder and saying, okay, talk. And as you're speaking there, it reminds me of that fellow, the clip in the beginning, uh, Savakul, is that his name? Yeah, William Savakul is his name. That's William right. Savakul. Yeah. Yeah. And I noticed as I listened to the long clip that you sent me, and long meaning I really enjoyed it, I was glad it was long, but I learned something you wouldn't know just reading a book. And that is at the end of each short answer, he would usually say something along the lines of, well, I guess that covers that, or that's about all I have to say about that. And very, very short, very, I'm closing the door now. That's all I want to say. And you can't get that out of the printed word because you'd cut that out if you were doing an interview you wouldn't want to hear the person saying something like that that they're that they're stopping it's just not it's just not relevant but when i listen to that audio now only because you found these tapes i'm able to say i'm hearing that idea of edith roosevelt closing the door and saying i don't want to interview with you about my husband i will not talk about my husband and his, his public life is out there don't talk about him and that's how that struck me and that's the kind of artifact you get here in remembering theodore roosevelt is you can hear that as you hear it nowhere else, it's one thing for you to tell me, well, they didn't want to talk about him, but I heard a little bit of it right there. And then I heard Mary's skill as an interviewer of still drawing things out of him, not letting him close the door with a few of the same words repeated again and again. She's going to get to the good part. And then you, as an author, are able to put it here and remembering Theodore Roosevelt, right? You, you must have had so many of those experiences. Well, I'm very grateful for the likes of Mary because Mary... Uh, is such a great interviewer. Now she got, she had training as well. She was enrolled in a master's program at Columbia. And these years, the 1950s are the heyday or the beginnings of the oral history movement around the United States. So, I mean, the writer's project that was started in the 1940s, uh, 30s and 40s, New Deal project to recover American stories is the very beginning of it. But by the 1940s and 50s, you have Columbia and Alan Nevins, Professor Alan Nevins at Columbia, who really kicks off the academic side of things. And, and that's where he's training the likes of Mary, Mary Hagedorn to transcribe effectively, to edit effectively, to, to try and you know, tease out answers. And she does this so effectively. She just lets people talk and fill up the silences. And for people like Alice Roosevelt, for example, she tries to get them back on track. I mean, Alice is very evasive. At one stage, Mary says to her, oh no, please don't talk anymore about the food. I wanna hear about the debutante ball and Mary, Mary and Alice Roosevelt won't give it to her. But, but Mary does everything she can to extract more information from people. And like you say, she hears what someone's saying and she notices that that might be interesting or important. And she tries to tease that out of them. Whereas Herman Hagedorn's approach, he didn't study oral history. He just interviewed people. He, he's more informed himself than just about anyone at this time about TR. So he's almost filling in the blanks himself. You know, when William Savakul or other political friends are talking about the 1912 election, Hagedorn is kind of saying, well, yeah, I know all about that. So what about this? And it, Mary lets them talk. And by letting them talk, they begin to say more. And they're, they like, you know, going back to what you were saying about how do we get these, these you know, historical people to talk about their historical experiences? Well, just leave space for them to do it. And that's, that's what Mary is so effective at doing. 
I told you that when I read that line, I said, gosh, I hope I don't do that because sometimes people will comment and say, why do you, why do you talk so much? Why do you have to get into things that you know? So I do try to do that consciously. So I had a chuckle at that, that that's, that's the exact kind of thing, because if we gloss over it, you have to be conscious of your audience listening and say, well, they might not know that story. They don't know, throw out a name like Eleanor Roosevelt, they'll assume that there was only one, but Ted, as if he wasn't already have problems separating himself from his father, his wife had to have the name of the first lady and his cousin. So yeah, it's amazing to be able to listen. It's so nice of you to post those online and do all that here and remembering Theodore Roosevelt because you yourself, you do a podcast, you do interviews. You are, if, if you're teaching and you're a professor, you have to be able to have that good skill of listening. It's not just you standing up there and talking, right? So you, you must have really gotten to know this fellow, Herman Hagedorn and Mary, and have affection for them because when you're listening to an interview, you say, go ahead, ask that question. Come on, get me more of that, right? Absolutely. Uh, I think the other thing that you do as a historian, too, with uh, some of these people like Hagedorn is you, you get their angle. I mean, he had an angle the whole time. Uh, and the first, the, the, the first three days after TR uh, passes away, Herman Hagedorn talks about how he wants to promote his anti-communist sentiments. That is, he, wa he wants to promote Roosevelt's anti-communism. Of course, that's the first Red Scare in 1919 to around 1921, say. And so he's got an angle. And in the 1950s, he's got that same angle as well. And interestingly, uh, there are other people that are promoting their angle about TR, whether it's conservation or progressivism. I've said this before, but everyone's got their own impression of former presidents, and TR is no exception to that. Hagedorn had his impression as well, and I think what you get from this is a difference between Herman Hagedorn and Mary Hagedorn, and the sort of neutral spirit of Mary, who's just interested in these people, and Herman, who wants to hear more about Americanism, about patriotism, about TR's impact on 1912 politics. Uh, so there's there's a there's a, a, a perspective that each one of these interviewers are coming to the table with. And I, I think we do it. I think we, we're probably more neutral than the likes of Herman Hagedorn, but we all have an ax to grind in some capacity. And I think saying that is a good and honest thing. Um, I think ignoring it makes you probably more like Herman Hagedorn, where you you're willing to talk over people, interrupt them and, and maybe not listen as well. But just for the record, I think you're an excellent listener. Well, thank you. Sorry, my mind wandered. What did you say? I wasn't listening. <laughs> well, everybody, you're enjoying my conversation with Michael Patrick Cullinane. He's here sharing his book, Remembering Theodore Roosevelt, Reminiscences of His Contemporaries. You can visit him at michaelpatrickcullinane.com, or you can find him on Twitter and LinkedIn. Plus, you don't want to miss him hosting the Gilded Age and Progressive Era podcast. Kathleen Dalton, who is the author of Theodore Roosevelt, A Strenuous Life, writes of remembering Theodore Roosevelt. Fascinated by Theodore Franklin or Eleanor Roosevelt, here is an edition of rare interviews full of news and insights unavailable elsewhere. Highly recommended for fans and scholars alike. Mike, you are steeped in TR's life and times. You have all this audio. You've written TR's ghost, Theodore Roosevelt's ghost, the full title of the book, this book. You've studied him so much. So when you hear that praise in remembering Theodore Roosevelt, you are offering news and insights. Just must be so great because it jumps out at me as being great. When you started listening to these reel-to-reel -reel tapes, what details rewrote or were fresh illumination for you about the Rough Riders life that you started to say exactly what Kathleen Dalton said? Hey, this is news. Hey, this is a new insight. What were some of those nuggets that that rewrote how you looked at Theodore Roosevelt and you said, I, I can I can make that into a book. People need to hear this. I mean, Kathleen Dalton's work is by far and away my my favorite work on TR. And the reason for that is because it is a human portrait. I feel like with her book, we get the, the hero, yes, but also the human, the sick child, the, the flawed politician, as well as the genius uh, uh, administrator and, and, and chief executive. Uh, we get everything, really, with, with her book. And that's what I hope these recordings add to. I mean, some of the things around his family life in particular were really extraordinary to me. I mean, he didn't yell at his kids and there was ample opportunity to yell at his kids. I mean, Kermit Roosevelt in the book, uh, there's a lot discussed about his antics. I mean, they, 
they raid the, the White House pantry on a, on a weekend, uh, a long weekend, basically denying the president's guests food for the Monday. I mean, this is something that would have been outrageous. And any father would, you know, yell at their kids and say, what did you do that for? But he just laughs at them. I mean, they they stubbed out cigarette butts on uh, furniture in the White House. They they broke things. They you know, they were kids and he accepted them as being kids. And I think maybe saw a little bit of his own childhood in that. And those sort of glimpses, particularly the intergenerational glimpses that we get here, whether it's Alice Roosevelt talking about having four or five generations of Roosevelt's in the room at one time, whether it's niece and, nieces and nephews talking about four or five generations, we get a broad view of what it was like to be in the Roosevelt circus, I would call it, you know, uh, in the extended universe of the Roosevelt's. And so I hope that that adds to the human portrait that the likes of uh, Kathy Dalton has written about and Stacey Cordery has written about in her book, Alice, uh, and, and others have as well, but away from this heroic portrait, because in many ways, I feel like we don't get to the, the germ of who these people are unless we understand that they, they have faults, as well as having heroic moments as well. They have uh, warts and all, just like all of us. It also can let us off the hook. It's a quote by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. that I often cite where he says, hey, I didn't want to give the speeches. I didn't want to lead the marches. I knew I was risking my life, but somebody had to do it. And I think when we look at a great figure in history, you say to yourself, well, sure, he could do it. No, he couldn't. If no one looked at that little scrawny, asthmatic Theodore Roosevelt with his glasses and not able to see a foot in front of him if he took him off and said, wow, this is going to be a great soldier. This is going to be a great statesman. And anybody who tells you that is lying to you because you know he had so many problems, so many obstacles to overcome, right? He was not going to be a guy that you would peg. But he did that thing where he says to his father, I'm, his father tells me you have to make your body, you have the mind. And he tells him, I will make my body. So I, that's just so inspiring here. And I, I love that you bring that up again and again, the real guy, the real guy, the real guy. He's not somebody carved on Mount Rushmore sitting on top of a horse, right? Well, I think that your point about, you know, that whole in the arena thing is at once an, an, an option for us to get in the arena ourselves and to do those things that require uh, strenuosity and, and duty and action. But in the other sense, it leaves us off the hook a little bit as well. If we fail, it doesn't mean that everything about us is a failure. It means that we failed in this one aspect and, and we can make mistakes, but we can also learn from them and, and develop ourselves. And also, I mean, in the case of Roosevelt, he fails in some ways and never learns from them. And that's part of his shortcomings as well. I think all of us have it. Even the greatest heroes in American history or world history have those shortcomings. None of us are perfect. And that makes for a good story. It makes for good biography. And it makes for a good connection that we can have with our past. You speak of being connected to the past. And it reminds me of when we were discussing Theodore Roosevelt's ghost. And the reason you give it that title is not because you have your Ouija board out and you're talking to him there having a seance in the White House lawn, but because he has become ephemeral. He's become almost a fictional character. I bet if you do one of those polls like that they've done with Winston Churchill over in the UK, people say, oh, he was a fictional character and they think Sherlock Holmes is real because <laughs> he does, he has done things and these stories came down to us that do sound as if they are impossible. So here you share in remembering Theodore Roosevelt, people who knew him, who were in the room with him, who could have just poked him, right? He's not a, he's not a ghost, he's a flesh and blood guy. So. How do you hope that reading this book will give readers a fuller understanding of what that was like? What was it like to sit and have a cup of coffee with him? He's drinking a lot of coffee and he's saying, oh, hey, let, let's have some coffee. Let me go off on one of the many subjects that he knew about. How do you hope readers will pick up your book, read it and say, hey, I, I kind of get an idea what it was like to live and work with the guy? So it's a great question. I think there are some things that will get us closer to TR here, maybe you know, close enough that we can imagine what it would be like to sit in the same room, drink a cup of coffee, or maybe a mint julep even if you were that lucky. But in the same breath, I hope that the tapes get us a little closer to that scrutiny that is essential for all historians. And, and that's about reading the sources and understanding that there might be some exaggerations or even some fabrications in there as well. So for example, in the last chapter of the book, one of the, the last surviving Rough Riders, Jesse Langdon, 
who was in his 90s when he passed away, provides some testimony in the 70s about what it was like being in Washington in those days when the Rough Riders were recruiting and what Theodore Roosevelt were like. And his stories are outrageous. I mean, enjoy them. They are the tallest tales in the book. But it does lead you to question whether any of these stories are accurate or not. Some of them have been uh, confirmed. Some of them have been repeated year after year at Rough Rider reunions, and you don't know if that makes them real or just kind of like those fishing stories that you tell about the one that got away. So the book hopefully gets us closer to the sources, and that, I think, gets us closer to the past and to understand what it might have been like to be in the room. It doesn't give you a perfect glimpse. It's still through the looking glass, but it does get you that little bit closer, I hope. It reminds me of when I interviewed Adam Higginbotham about his book, Midnight in Chernobyl. And he said, you come, you interview people and they think, well, you want the big story. You don't and no, I'm a historian. I just want the facts. And he says how there are people he would see people out of the corner of his eye. He goes to the firehouse and he wants to do an interview and he sees the guy on a chair when he's not thinks he's not looking changing the clock and stopping the clock at the time the meltdown was. And he says, that, first of all, that, that had nothing to do with the meltdown. No clock stopped, but every clock in Chernobyl in the area, it's completely, it's, everyone stopped it. And I said to him too, like, there, there's always the little doll, like in the disaster movie laying there or the teddy bear. And, oh, we all think of the child drop their little teddy bear. He says, yeah, they litter those things all over the place. And it's not a, not a historical artifact. They're recreating it. It's, it's disaster tourism and things like that. So I love that you get to that here in Remembering Theodore Roosevelt, where you say, this guy is telling a great story, but is it the true story? Especially when you're dealing with somebody dynamic like TR, who he would gild the lily. He wanted to be that center of attention. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you have to take everything with a pinch of salt from TR to these characters. And then I think to, to us as well, what, what are, what's our baggage? How are we approaching the subject? I do think though with the audio, we get a little bit closer to how people were thinking. You know, the original uh, transcripts that were, were released as part of the oral history project were heavily edited. They were edited by the Hagedorns. They were also edited by the people that were doing the interviews. So people like, you know, TR's nieces and nephews had an opportunity to edit their own uh, uh, transcripts. Now that's terrible because it means that they can take out the things that they think are going to be disreputable. But for a historian, that's so important. And, and, and so we have to take everything with a, with a grain of salt. But ultimately, I think the recordings are as close as we're going to get to how people were thinking at that time, at least anyway, about TR and his contemporaries. You call chapter 13 of Remembering Theodore Roosevelt, When Trumpets Call. And this man was fascinating, Stanley M. Isaacs, because He's a guy who has a period of TR's life that we don't endlessly hear about when he was one of the police commissioners in New York City because that's enough. You know, we hear, oh, hey, he didn't take any guff. And every time crime explodes in New York City, as it's exploding now, we say we need a man like Theodore Roosevelt. And Tom Selleck has TR's picture there on the wall in Blue Bloods and things like that. But that, that's not what it was. First of all, he was only one of four. They were all equal, something he chafed in. Imagine Theodore Roosevelt having to be an equal of four other people instead of the man leading the charge, right? He was also head of the health commissioner. New York was not greater New York than it is now. So there's many things you can learn about that period that give us a fresher insight, and it's relevant to today. How great is that? So when you hear from him, when you hear from Mr. Isaacs, what light does that shed for you on that period of TR's life that because he did so much is really easy to gloss over as, oh yeah, he was a great police commissioner and now let's move on to the Rough Riders. Yeah, Stanley Isaac's uh, testimony was great because it, it was, he's one of those intergenerational characters as well. You know, he met TR early on in his career, was inspired by him, mainly by the sort of no nonsense approach to government and good government and transparency that TR had. But that led him to kind of shape his entire career around TR's or his idea, his conception of who TR was. So, I mean, he goes on to be part of the New York City Council for years to come and uh, would be a major, a major thrust in uh, LaGuardia's years in New York. So, uh, so that's interesting for that, that part. But not only does TR crop up in Isaac's life later on, he crops up in the strangest places like Henry Stimson, 
1944, and you know, he was just about the busiest person in the world at that stage, you know, as Secretary of War. He brings all of the chiefs of staff and other sort of civilian people into a, civilian military leaders into the room and says, I want to talk to you about TR in order to try and inspire them. Uh, about the, the legacy that TR has left for the fight in World War II. I mean, the, the point is about both of these, uh, these testimonies is that TR remained an important part of those people's lives that he touched early on. And those people went on to be a very important part of the American century and, and now still is informing a lot of our thinking about domestic, foreign policy, and just personal values and, and personal development. I think ideas about leadership in corporate America. I mean, I've heard a lot of people talk about that, uh, TR's connection to that. So he's a, he's a relevant force in American culture today. I wanted to show while you're speaking there, I dug off my shelf since I talk about the books that we share in person. This is an excellent one if people want to read something. It's called Commissioner Roosevelt, the story of Theodore Roosevelt and the New York City Police Force, 1895 to 1897. So if people want to pick that up. This, this author, unfortunately, has passed away or I would be chomping at the bit to interview him about that book. But so many parts of his life that are so fascinating here. Earlier, I cited Kathleen Dalton and that she highly recommended remembering Theodore Roosevelt for fans and scholars alike. So to wrap up, I'd like to ask you to make your pitch because as you can see from behind me and behind you, there's a ton of Theodore Roosevelt books out there. They aren't all equal. They cover different parts of his life. He's such a dynamic figure. People's heads must spin. And if they only know a little bit about him, they may think, well, what book do I pick up? I, I would like to get to know the guy, but now I don't know if I want to slog through an 800 word bio of what somebody's saying and rehashing. Why should they pick up Remembering Theodore Roosevelt to get to know the 26th president in a way that readers just won't if they simply read one of the biographies that's out there? Yeah, thanks for that pitch and for the plug and for mentioning <laughs> Kathleen's uh, very kind endorsement. I think I'd like to be modest and just say, I'm not sure that this is the entry level book. I think Kathleen's book is the entry level book. I almost feel like once you're done reading that, come to mind because you're gonna get the rest of the details, you know, like the, the recordings as well. They're there for, for everyone to delve into. You know, as I say, contact the National Park Service or indeed reach out to me, I'd be happy to share them with you. But these these recordings give you that sort of that next level of depth about what it was like to be around TR. What was it like to play tennis with TR? What was it like to eat dinner with him? What was it like to be a political acolyte or a, a college person that was, you know, just came into contact with him at a, at a, at a meeting? Um, it's that's where this book takes you. I, I don't think you'll get the broad brushstrokes about all his achievements or all of his failures for that matter. There's plenty of books out there about th that. This gets you a little bit closer to the man, the human being that was Theodore Roosevelt. Well, Michael Patrick Cullinane, certainly I enjoyed getting closer to him today. And I thought I was as close as I could get. The Greeks have a saying, but in the underwear, you know, you're as close as a butt in underwear. So this is how I felt here from reading, remembering Theodore Roosevelt. Thank you so much for sharing him with me today. I appreciate your kind words about my show and my interview style. I hope people will definitely check out your podcast and I wish you the best of luck with this book, with all of your works. I hope readers will pick up a copy. If you have read some of those other works about Theodore Roosevelt, hear from the people who really knew him. What a blessing this is to people who love history. You could hear what people really thought about the guy, this American hero, this singular American who is somebody just like us, inspiring and really enjoyable are these voices and your book. Thanks so much again for sharing it with me. Thanks a million, Dan. Thanks so much for having me on again. I really, uh, really enjoy the show and it's always a pleasure to speak with you. It's a pleasure to speak with you too. Get to work on that next book. It doesn't have to be Theodore Roosevelt. It's going to be Theodore Roosevelt, I'm afraid. <laughs> Maybe after that one, it won't be, but the next one will be. Uh, yeah. Well, you'll be right here. I'll, I'll, go ahead. Give us the tease. What is it? Uh, it's going to be about his presidency, actually. I mean, I don't think there's been enough written about it, believe it or not. And uh, I want to delve into, I still want to delve into the wider universe of friends that he had. I think sometimes they're almost as interesting as he is himself. You cannot stop a man who loves Theodore Roosevelt. I know that from experience. He's just as dynamic as ever is Michael Patrick Cullinane. Thanks again for joining us. I look forward to that book. Go get to work on it. Thanks, Dean. We'll do. Again, the book is... Remembering Theodore Roosevelt, Reminiscences of His Contemporaries. 
As always, you can find the Amazon link to purchase your copy at the historyauthor.com page for this episode. Every time you buy a book through us, you're being a little bit of Doc Brown from Back to the Future for us. You're making sure that the flux capacitor in our time machine keeps humming like usual. I can't thank Michael Patrick Cullinan enough for joining us today and for sharing these forgotten memories of America's dynamic 26th Commander in Chief. You know, people talk a lot about history as if it's a single authority, as if it's a person you could take out for coffee. They'll say, you're on the wrong side of history, or history shows, or I'm a student of history, like they sat in its class. It doesn't always mean something, but it means something today with Michael Patrick Cullinane. History owes him a huge debt for taking the time to dig through those boxes at T.R.'s birthplace and bring us these forgotten first-person accounts. It really scares me as someone who loves history that we could have lost these forever if he doesn't open that box. Please do check him out at michaelpatrickcullinane.com and you can listen to him at the Gilded Age and Progressive Era podcast. Plus, he's on Twitter and LinkedIn. And as you heard in today's interview, he's more than happy to hear from people who want to hear more about TR. If you enjoyed watching this conversation, please do subscribe on our YouTube and Rumble channels for future journeys in the Wayback Machine. You can find there our previous interview with Michael Patrick Cullinane. That's about his TR prize winning book, Theodore Roosevelt's Ghost, the history and memory of an American icon. That's it for this installment of the History Author Show. I hope you'll join us for our next all new interview right here on iHeartRadio or wherever you enjoyed this journey into yesterday. Until that next trip into the past together, on behalf of Michael Patrick Cullinane and all those people who knew and loved Theodore Roosevelt, thanks so much for time traveling with us today, and have a great week. We still call it Broadway, but what's in a name? Take it from Georgie, it isn't the same. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore. Like, well, covers that, doesn't it?